we could probably start in. Warm greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining our session. My name is Panchali Saikya. I'm a program officer with the Water and Sanitation Department at the Stockholm International Water Institute, CV. Uh, on behalf of all our co-conveners, we welcome you to this session where we will learn, reflect, and discuss on these three concepts of priority setting, commitments, and accountability, which you may have noted in our session title. We will be hearing from our experts on how national multi-stakeholder partnerships. Hola. I think we have someone. Yeah, could you please unmute yourself? Thank you so much. All this technical glitch happened in this kind of online session. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we'll be hearing, as I was saying, from our experts on how national multi-stakeholder partnerships, platforms, and tools that are built around these three concepts contributed to improved water governance. There will be also country examples presented on the practical implementation of the tools and how this have left, uh, led to practical changes. Later in the session, we will go into group discussions where you will get the opportunities to have an in-depth discussion around this concept. There will be three groups, as you can see in the slide. Uh, one group, group one will be discussing on commitments, group two on priority setting, and group, group three on accountability. We have our experts and facilitator for each of these three sessions. If you have a preference for which group you would like to join, uh, we would request you to please rename yourself so that we can request our colleague Henning, who is supporting us to, in the breakout room, to put you in the right group. Uh, for renaming yourself, you need to put the group number, uh, say, for example, group number one, uh, and then your name. Yeah, Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, if, you, if you have a preference, please rename yourself. I'm sure many of you may already be familiar with the Zoom and renaming, but for those who might not know, we have some instructions on how you can rename yourself. First, click on the participants uh, list on, on the bottom, you see that icon, then hover over to your name on the list on the right hand corner, uh, click more, then click rename. Then you can add the number of the group you would like to join and your name, uh, that will be it. For those who doesn't have any preference, uh, please don't bother, we can randomly send it to you in a, in the, in a group there later on. So let's get started. Uh, before this uh, group discussion, we have some introductory presentations, some perspectives shared from different countries um, to set the ground for us to be able to discuss more in-depthly during the group discussions. So first, I would like to welcome Professor Juliet Willits to give us this introduction on what these three concepts really mean, um, what we can learn about this concept in terms of its importance and how these concepts are interlinked. Uh, Juliet is the research director from Sustainable Futures, University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. She is a water and sanitation expert and leads the applied research to improve development policy and practices uh, and addressing social justice and sustainable development, including achievement of the global sustainable development goals. Welcome, Juliet, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Panjali, and welcome. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Great to have the chance to speak with you. Sorry, I'm just checking that I'm actually sharing the right thing. Okay, so this introductory presentation is about these three concepts of priority setting, commitments, and accountability. And we start off with the question of why should we care about these three things in particular? And that's because we think they're the keys that can actually accelerate progress towards SDG six. Um, priorities are important because if we don't select the right priorities, clearly we're not going to um, be making our way in the right direction. If our commitments aren't connected to action, then also um, we won't be able to follow that path. And lastly, accountability for progress is critical to help us to move forward towards SDG 6. But how are these three concepts interrelated? Well, in an ideal world, there's some kind of virtuous cycle uh, where you undertake priority setting, 
And then based on those priorities, you're able to align commitments to them um, by different stakeholders and particularly government. Based on those commitments, we can then look at progress and hold people to account for progress. And in that way, we can these three concepts can reinforce one another. But there's a lot of questions that comes up. Firstly, around priority setting. On what basis in most different countries are priorities set? Is it based on analysis? Is it based on politics? Is it based on particular views? Who sets the priorities? And who is it that endorses them? And if we look at commitments, we have to ask, you know, what actually really makes each of us commit and different organizations to commit so that commitments are meaningful and something that we're prepared to be held to. And lastly, on accountability, how can different st uh, stakeholders within the sector hold each other to account? And the answer to that is that we need a real focus on the people in the sector. Each of us as individuals, the organizations we represent, the different institutions and agencies that make up the different parts of our sector. And if we want to bring these people together, one of the ways that that happens in most countries at national level and also sometimes at local levels is through multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships where we have not only ministries and agencies responsible for water, sanitation and hygiene, but also the many different other types of organisations and the connections between those organisations. So based on some recent research we did about multi-stakeholder partnerships and accountability, we found that there are four critical ingredients if multi-stakeholder partnerships are actually to function effectively. That includes the stakeholders actually having a shared vision and purpose. It includes that they have transparent collaborative processes and rules of engagement. We need to, ways to equalize power when we have different sets of stakeholders that come from different positions in society. They need to be shared decision-making, action and feedback processes. And lastly, and critically, there needs to be a form of mutual learning amongst the different stakeholders to evolve the partnership over time. It shouldn't be something that's static, but it's something that's dynamic and can grow. And if we have those effective partnership settings, then within it, we can set up mutual accountability between stakeholders. And again, based on recent research, we've distilled, I guess, five elements that are really important for accountability. Firstly, if you're to have accountability between stakeholders, each stakeholder's responsibilities or commitments actually need to be stated. They need to be clarified. Then, secondly, they actually need to report on progress or performance against that. But that's not enough. If it's just about reports that people don't read, data that's in difficult forms that can't be accessed, or only information shared behind closed doors, that means that it's difficult to have number three, which is critical for accountability. Performance needs to be actually discussed and explained. A key uh, part of accountability is answerability, which means being able to explain why things are as they are. Why is progress good? Why is progress not so good? Then we have a way to learn and understand what's happening in each stakeholder group. If we are able to have that debate, we then come to the fourth point, which is that in the case of mutual accountability, it's not about some nasty punishment or sanction against people that changes um, how people act, but it's more subtle. It's more relational and reputational. Losses and gains for different groups and it's that consciousness of the potential loss or gain of reputation or relations that causes stakeholders to think and to um, put their efforts behind their commitments and to try and follow through. And that ideally leads you to this number five, which is changed behavior so that we're all moving in the same direction against the commitments. And we learn from um, lack of progress or um, different things that happen that may not be what we was originally planned. So then if we move from just talking about the concepts, we wanted to introduce in this session two tools which have been used globally in multiple countries. And you'll be hearing today from two of those countries about their experiences. And those are the WASHBAT uh, developed through UNICEF in, in partnership with many governments and SWA, the Sanitation and Water for All, their mutual accountability mechanism. 
So I'm just going to briefly introduce those two tools so that you have that background and um, are aware of them if they're not something that you're, has been used in your country. So what is the WASHBAT? Um, the uh, WASHBAT is a step-by-step -step methodology. It helps stakeholders to collaboratively identify and propose solutions. And a key focus, the B in WASHBAT is a bottleneck. A bottleneck is where things get stuck. It's where the sector is not able to progress. It's the things that hold the sector back. And the WASHBAT has a key focus on that because if we can unblock those blockages, then clearly we're going to be able to make what much more progress. So it asks questions like what the key constraints are to scaling up, and what the constraints are to sustaining quality services. And then it asks, how can we remove some of these blockages? And in what order and sequence and priority should we remove these different blockages? The main adopter of a tool like the WASHBAT is the government, but it needs broad stakeholder ownership and involvement so that all sector actors are both validating the, um, the analysis um, and uh, decisions about where the, the country stands and able to input to an understanding of the blockages and how they could be released. So an outcome of the tool is uh, different investment and funding activities that can focus on the bottlenecks. And act these activities are integrated into government systems and um, garner political support. So overall, the WASHBAT is a way to bring stakeholders together in an open forum to explore the factors that are constraining the sector progress. And unpacking it a little further in terms of the foundations on which it's built, it's set up on a framework that has three layers, a focus on the governance functions, institutional factors and structural factors. And the governance functions are, I guess, typical ones that we see, strategy, financing, et cetera. And I think what's interesting is the institutional factors that include a focus on other elements such as de decentralization and how it's working in a country or public financial management, social norms. All of these things um, significantly affect whether or not a sector functions well or not. So the process involves assessment against some more than 90 criteria. So it's a very detailed assessment. And there are many web um, uh, resources and, and tools online if you'd like to look into it further. So moving from there, some brief background on SWA's mutual accountability mechanism, sometimes known as the MAM. Um, this accountability mechanism is a process for governments with stakeholders to make commitments together on specific actions that are about what each act is going to do usually in support of the government's commitments towards achieving the targets of the SDGs. And the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership expects all partners to make such commitments and to collaborate together in the making of those commitments and to report back on them. So similarly to the WASHBAT, it aims to reinforce multi-stakeholder decision-making among partners. And on the bottom right, you see some of the commitments that have been made to date across many, many different countries. So a key part of the MAM is reliant on those commitments. And if those commitments are vague or lofty or unclear, it's very, very hard to tell if there's progress, very, very hard to, tell, to hold anyone to account for um, the commitments that have been made. And so there's a focus on making sure they're very specific and it's clear what is the focus, that they're measurable, they're actionable, they're relevant, does it help fix an issue, which links us back to this idea of priority setting. Does, are they relevant in that they actually address one of those bottlenecks and um, issues that needs to be solved? And that, that time bound so that we understand how fast or how slow we think we could tackle them. And in the making of these commitments, government leadership and ownership is critical, but also the broad participation of other stakeholders in the sector. So some common elements across these two tools. Um, so as you can see, they both rely on multi-stakeholder platforms or partnerships. And as I spoke at the beginning, there are some key aspects that we need to pay attention to um, for those platforms to be effective and to provide a site for either priority setting or accountability. Both these processes really value evidence makes, um, yeah, evidence informed decision-making. They support consensus building, 
They promote clarity of roles and better transparency. They promote coordination between stakeholders and government ownership. And lastly, they help us monitor, report, and know that we're moving forward. So that's the theory. Um, it's all simple when it's in slides on a page like that, but as we know, the reality in practice is much more complex. And I'm glad that we'll be able to hear some practical um, experiences today. So that's all from me, handing back to you, Panchali. Thank you so much, Juliet, for the clearly providing us uh, on the theoretical aspect of this concept and also introducing the two tools to our participants, the washbed and the mutual accountability mechanism. And like you said, let's get into the practicalities, how we can actually apply this concept in practice. And for this, we actually have two country representatives who will be sharing with us and speaking about their experiences on these two tools and how this was used in the WASH sector, the water uh, sanitation and hygiene sector for priority setting commitment and accountability. Firstly, let me welcome Tobias Omufoko, a senior WASH and public health expert and currently the country coordinator and CEO at WASH Alliance Kenya who will be speaking about his experience with commitment making using the mutual accountability mechanism in Kenya. Over to you, Tobias. Kindly unmute yourself, Tobias. We can't hear you. Thank you so much. As usual, thank you, these things. Uh, thank you very much. In Kenya, I already have had um, uh, a third setting we have had uh, sector priorities that we set together in a multi stakeholder uh, partnership. Next, please. Next. Yes. So, our background is that uh, we, the sanitation and the water for all in Kenya uh, has come together with, within a partnership uh, at kind of level engagement. And to date, we have had. Um, a country uh, master stakeholder partnerships. We have had, uh, we have set country priorities, and now we're using the MAM to monitor the priorities, uh, the, the conclusion. I'll give you a brief on how we did that and where we are at as of now. Next. So the process now uh, of, uh, uh, of this was that the process of Kenya is co chaired by the Ministry of uh, Health. And the Ministry of Water and Sanitation. And the Ministry of Water and Sanitation is the lead in this process. Uh, the CSO focal person, I would always like to rally other constituents, make the commitments, follow up the process with the government partners. And then the government leadership we have seen is very crit critical in terms of leading the process forward and in terms of involving all uh, the stakeholders in the process. Next. We have brought together all constituents, uh, the, civil, the government itself as a lead, uh, the civil society, the research and academia, private sector, and development partners. And in this, we also have ensured that uh, all of them participate together. What we did, we, we, were, we, we sat together, all of us, uh, in a sitting uh, led by the minister, the state minister for water and sanitation, just to make it very high level and make it really politically uh, inclusive. And so the Minister of Water was the one who was heading that. And the Minister of Health had the director who was supporting the activity. Uh, the CSO focal person, uh, we gave the leadership to Wash Alliance Kenya, who is me. But we, has, we had partners in the CSOs who were also supporting the process. Then uh, research in, in academia, we gave to African Population and Health Research, research uh, Together with the universities like Uma University, Stockholm Government Institute, WhatsApp, Women, Water and Sanitation. And the private sector also was there, led by Sanaji. And in there, we had Sanivation, uh, the Global Environment uh, Sanitation, and then the uh, CPG Empty Association. Lastly, uh, we also had development partners led by USID. Uh, and the uh, UNICEF is part of it in Kenya, USA, the World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank, and the Dutch Embassy in Kenya. These are some of the concerns that we had in the formation of uh, our uh, 
uh, mom commitments. But there are many more partners behind the scenes who are part of this. In this meeting, these are the ones who are there. Uh, what you have done is try to be all inclusive as possible. Next. Now, what have we learned in all this? As said earlier in the, in the previous speaker, is that we have learned that the, the government leadership role is key. Uh, government ensures that the transparent and collaborative assignments of roles and responsibilities. Actually, we sat together, all of us, and the government, I said, and the Minister of Water, and we are all ourselves as a sector players assigned ourselves roles in the commitments that we had. Then uh, again, we said that uh, having a lead for each constituent again is a plus for us because the lead now will have together all other constituent uh, partners. Uh, for example, the CSO lead, who is me, now my role is part of it, is to have together all CSOs to ensure that the commitment we have, we have had towards the sector commitments that we have as a, a national uh, are actually actualized. So each, each, each lead in the constituents ensures that all the members there are added together and they, uh, they make a common stand towards the commitments. Then lead for, for reporting and follow up. Again, uh, all of us are sometimes are always busy. And sometimes you lose things through the cracks in terms of uh, reporting and follow up. So again, we have uh, one specific lead whose role is to do um, the reporting and follow ups, bring us all together. Because sometimes the government is, is busy doing other things, all of us doing other things. So when you sit down as lead with the constituents, and see what you've done uh, to ensure that we are supporting the, 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 the mom commitments. Uh, this lead now, his work, his role is that, he or she's uh, role is that he goes around and brings to put to, together all the reports that you have had as constituents and also makes follow up on what you are doing together. Again, one thing I found very important, of course, um, as even alluded earlier, is uh, the issue about inclusivity. And, uh, the accountability mechanism should and does for us include a wide array of stakeholders to ensure that the marginalized uh, and the groups are equally inclusive and their voices are heard. I go even further and say that we in Kenya have a system of government which is national and also regional. So we have gone further, and I'll do that later, that we have gone further and ensure that these commitments also are brought together in the kinds of governance kinds of governors who are now governing uh, the regional uh, governments to ensure that what we are doing at national level cascades down to the uh, counties also. And this is done by us including the kinds of governors who are now in charge of the counties to be part of our division at national level. So that ensures that all of us are in, are in it together. One, again, I want to give an example is that what you have achieved so far in this, one thing you have achieved this quarter I'm saying we are only to achieve one thing is that I wanted to make sanitation management policy. What we have, we have to collectively and uh, together with, in partnership uh, put together a sanitation management policy. And we have gone at national level and we have gone around uh, the regions ensuring that there's inputs in that policy at, at regional level. There was um, a secular meeting uh, for inputting. Then there was also another meeting for validation in all the regions in this country, to ensure that what we are doing at national level is goes right down to the uh, uh, sub-county level and also the county level. So that ensures that we don't just talk about the mom commitments at national level. They go down right up to regional level. So that's one thing we've achieved uh, this quarter. We have been able to do original meetings and also validation meetings at regional level. And we're waiting only for one, one national meeting on, valida on uh, validation at the stakeholder meeting nationally. And then uh, by the end of this year, that's we have achieved one thing, and that is a uh, finalized the sanitation management policy. Next, please. Next. Oh, <laughs> there was something else before this. Okay, there are a few challenges, of course, that we went through in doing that and making that first law. The obvious one is about the COVID-19 restrictions, which affected all of us, uh, sometimes the lockdowns, sometimes the restrictions. Uh, and also we are urging more partners to come in. We haven't had as 
all the partners included in this, both at national level and also at, at the regional levels. So uh, we are bringing more and more partners. But as, as, as I said earlier, partners come in with this value of the partnerships. So we are bringing as much as possible uh, the partnerships. Then coordination of the sector has been has not been as so effective uh, from because of the mandate that was there earlier. Uh, it was the Minister of Water and the Minister of Health at some point, but now the mandate now has gone to Ministry of Water, and you are seeing that um, you have done so well, considering how you have done with the sanitation management policy. So as of now, we are seeing we are moving well. Then accountability mechanism process has been slow at the county, uh, at the country implementation as country implementation take, take, takes place. Again, this this uh, takes account what I said earlier is about. Um, us making the commitments at national level and then cascading now to the county level and going to counties uh, at the regional level, bring, bring them in to ensure that what we discuss at the national level is a replica of what is at the county level. So with all this, I can say that so far Kenya has done quite well in terms of bringing all partners in the, uh, the, sec uh, the MAM commitments. First of all, making um, uh, the jo uh, uh, joint uh, national priorities then uh, bring them together to all partners and asking how will partners fit in all this? How will they support the government leadership? And then each constituents now says how they want to be able to support that. And then we have said that uh, every quarter we're monitoring progress from all constituents. So it's now up to the, 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 the leads in those constituents to be able to have their some meetings with the constituents. And then we have one, one national um, meeting now to monitor where we are every quarter. And I said earlier, for this quarter, we said we have deal with the sanitation management policy, which we have done and almost finalizing by the end of the year. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Momofoko. I think it really provided us a very clear picture on how we can really apply the mom in practice. And one of the things that you really raised strike me was how you were really trying to implement into different levels from national to yeah, regional level. And that was really very crucial, I think, when we are trying to talk about accountability mechanism and making commitments. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Thank you. Now let's move to our next uh, uh, country here. We have Dr. Saima Safiq uh, from Pakistan. She's the manager at the WASH Strategic Planning Unit in the Ministry of Climate Change. Government of Pakistan uh, to speak about her experiences with priority setting uh, using the WASH bottleneck analysis tool in Pakistan. Uh, the WASH bottleneck analysis tool about which um, uh, Professor Juliet had shared earlier, uh, in case if you missed, uh, we will also share the links for both MUM and for WASHBED in the Pathable chat for more information later on. But let's hear from Dr. Shaima Safiq. Uh, I will actually uh, like to ask you a question before you start the presentation. Um, Pakistan has a decentralized form of government and WASH is a provincial subject, but you have shown very pro good progress in terms of WASH in that provincial level, especially after the 2050, uh, 2015 when uh, SDGs were launched. Would you like to share with participants as to how Pakistan has institutionalized some progresses and mechanisms which have resulted in this outcome? Over to you, and please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Panjali. Um, uh, I believe there are colleagues from uh, all the different time zones in this uh, session, so a very warm welcome to all of them, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the time zone participants. Um, my name is Dr. Saima Shafiq. I am working as a program manager in uh, WASH Strategic Unit in Ministry of Climate Change. Just to uh, give you um, an overview of our experiences around specifically around the creating the enabling environment uh, for voice sector in Pakistan. I would like to very briefly uh, comment on uh, that what kind of system is uh, in place as far as the WASH uh, sector is concerned, the form of government. So it's a very decentralized, you are very rightly pointed out that it's a very decentralized form of government as far as WASH sector interventions are concerned. At the federal level, it's Ministry of Climate Change that has a mandate for the 
for the wash and um, uh, specifically we are uh, uh, we are concerned with the uh, policy formulation providing guidance to the provinces coordination and reporting whereas provinces are independent in taking up their decisions and they have the mandate and role for uh, taking up the implementation of wash uh, related interventions both for infrastructure both for hard and soft uh, components. So uh, post uh, 2011, uh, when uh, the 18th amendment was introduced, there was a dire need that emerged at that time to create a coordination mechanism at the federal level because uh, before 18th amendment, before 2011, it's a constitutional amendment. So before that, uh, they, they was a, there was a coordination or the federal led government system that was present, but immediately after the 18th Amendment, uh, the, four, uh, the immediate three to four years, there was a dire need that emerged on for the for creating of an enabling environment in Pakistan. And, uh, but at that time, the, 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 the efforts were being made, but there was a lot of uh, uh, thinking through uh, going on at that time. And post 2015, when uh, there was uh, uh, the, the uh, SDG came in that also gives us an entry point for rethinking that how we can move forward uh, to create a very strong coordination mechanism. Rather, it gives us kind of a rationalization to create a strong coordination mechanism between federal and provincial government setups. Uh, so it's uh, you know, there were a few binding commitments and non-binding commitment that was uh, that were under consideration for that. So uh, one was the, one of them was SDG, and then the other one binding commitment was uh, this uh, NDCs uh, that was uh, the post Paris Agreement uh, part. And then uh, there was another uh, commitment which is also non-binding that is SWA HLM commitment. So this gives us an, a strong rationalization to create an enabling environment framework at national level, which actually supports us in creating and uh, reporting or the strong communication coordination mechanism with the provinces as well, and also uh, to create a kind of an, um, an, an, a, an accountability mechanism. So uh, with this uh, uh, rationalization, there were, uh, uh, can you move on to next slide? Henning, please move on to next slide. Henning, you have to move on to next slide. Yeah, thank you. So um, at that time, they, uh, the, with the support of uh, UNICEF colleagues, with the, sorry, the earlier one, Thank you. So uh, at that time, uh, this was discussed among uh, a consultative process was initiated with the wash sector partners in which UNICEF has supported us and four major processes were under consideration at that time to uh, look at how we can formalize this enabling environment. Uh, so one of uh, them was the National Regional and International Commitment Forum that includes SACOSAN, TACOSAN and SWA, uh, SWA HLM uh, commitment process. The other process was joint sector review and board uh, wash back uh, uh, tool. Uh, then advocacy and media campaign was another process which was under uh, uh, consideration. And then uh, this uh, government uh, formal budget preparation was uh, another process which was uh, which was uh, uh, considered important at that time. And these four processes, although some of them were strong in one of the provinces, some of them were strong uh, were uh, at a far farther point in other provinces as, or well established in other provinces as well. Uh, they they were happening, but they were not harmonized. Uh, some of these uh, even their timeline was not aligned. So there was a need to actually uh, harmonize them to synchronize the process and also to create a formal. Um, a framework where the whole coordination can be reflected on and a conceptual framework is given from federal level to the provinces as well so that they come on uh, one page as far as this uh, uh, mechanism is concerned. So uh, UNICEF uh, has supported us in developing this conceptual framework and one of uh, the colleagues who spoke for ministry as well, Mr. Kamran, has provided quite a valuable inputs in formalizing this uh, 
uh, in uh, formal, uh, formalizing this conceptual framework. Can you move on to the next slide where the for conceptual framework can, yes, this is the conceptual framework that was put in place uh, as a guidance from federal level to the provinces as well and to all the voice sector stakeholders as, as well. If you see on the right side of the uh, figure, it gives us an input uh, for the uh, for the evidence based uh, uh, studies and the surveys that uh, are concluding in the December um, and from December onward we uh, take in inputs uh, the evidence based data that is available from these studies that is taken up uh, in organize uh, uh, in organizing the provincial GSR and wash bags. from December onward we take the process till uh, it takes uh, almost three to four months process to uh, actually, uh, do the provincial GS, GSRs and wash bed, uh, apply wash bed tools and then consolidate it at national uh, at national level. So one national GSR also takes place, but this 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 GSR process and wash bed gives us the the commitment process that is emerging from the ground and formalizing. And these provincial commitments are then taken forward into the budget preparation processes. And then from, from, uh, from there onward, the budget announcement takes place and this cycle moves on. But if you see that this cycle is not moving on the right side of the uh, conceptual framework, it is also moving on the left side of the conceptual framework where a lot of uh, inputs are being taken in and out. Like these provincial commitments are also feeding into our community campaigns, to our mass media campaigns, to our advocacy campaigns, also feeding into the monitoring uh, processes as well uh, as a as a... Uh, as a uh, feedback and the, this is also putting in base for the uh, PACOSEN, SWHLM commitments and SECOSEN processes as well. If you see that, that these uh, provincial national processes are then to link to regional and global processes as well. And this aligned process moves on in cycle. So now we are moving, uh, we are taking this uh, framework as an enabling uh, environment framework for as a guidance for uh, all the sector stakeholders and for the government stakeholders as well. Uh, please move to the next slide. So uh, if you see that uh, these GSR processes, they are core or the spirit of this enabling environment. These commitments are not coming in as commitment, but they are also feeding in to uh, help us in developing and designing the flagship program of Prime Minister as well, like the Clean Green Pakistan movement that was developed based on the commitments that we have uh, worked upon in past uh, three to four years. And it has evolved as Clean Green Pakistan movement. And then later on the Clean Green Pakistan Index, this is also emerged as one of the commitment under uh, earlier JSRs. And now we are moving little ahead of this program uh, from program designing as well. Now our next GSR cycle is also will also be feeding in to evaluation of what we have done earlier under the Prime Minister flagship programs as well. So uh, these are few examples from the from the country from the grassroots level to uh, enlighten you all about that how we have utilized different processes and how we have we have created a synchronization and harmonization uh, while engaging all sector stakeholders while engaging the provincial governments, while engaging the national governments and development sector partners to evolve to a process where uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's supporting the, the flagship program for our leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Safiq. I think it was quite insightful to see how these commitments were kind of informing different interventions and campaigns that you had shared. And this Clean Green Pakistan initiative is, I think, quite insightful for our participants to know. Uh, thank you to you both. I'm afraid we have uh, we don't have enough time left for taking up any questions. I'm sure audiences they have a lot of questions to ask you both and also uh, to Professor Juliet. Uh, but I'm requesting everyone to hold on their thought and probably raise some of these issues during the breakout group. Uh, we will now move to the group discussions. Uh, the participants uh, will be sent to different groups. Uh, as I requested, please rename yourself using the group number if you have a preference to go to any particular group. Uh, so you will see here the different groups. I would like to now introduce to our experts and facilitators who will be guiding you through in the group discussions. And they will be taking a few questions uh, uh, which they will be discussing through using different methods of discussion there. Uh,
please do share your experiences and I encourage everyone to speak up and also share because the chat function, uh, we will try to uh, enable it, but it might not work. So please do uh, jump in to yeah, raise your reflections and inputs. After about 25 minutes, you will be brought back to the plenary discussion session where we will be raising up and uh, discussing what you have uh, reflected upon in your own groups. So group one is about commitments, uh, which will be facilitated by Mariana Diaz Simpson. Uh, Mariana is a coordinator of the mutual accountability mechanism at Sanitation and Water for All. Please join us, Mariana. Group two will be on priority setting facilitated by Ricard Chine. He is the advisor uh, with the Water and Sanitation Department at CV, the Stockholm International Water Institute. And group three, we have on accountability, which will be facilitated by expert Irma Uitwal. Uh, she is the WASH consultant and IRC associate. I would now request uh, our colleague Henning to please uh, send everyone to the group discussion. Please enjoy the discussion. And as I said, I encourage everyone to pitch in and have a very interactive discussion. And don't worry, this, this questions will also be shared by the facilitator in your own groups. Uh, and they will be taking it through one by one. I see we are slowly moving into the groups. Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone is back to the plenary. I hope you have had an interesting discussion. I was jumping in and out of different groups just to get an idea of what was going on in the discussion. And I see a lot of discussions. There were some common grounds uh, looking into representation, the challenges, and the need for including diverse group, more of marginalized group, uh, need for feedback systems and strong feedback systems, and also the government uh, leadership and, yeah, uh, role and ownership, which was also highlighted by some of our speakers in the plenary. I would not reflect anything on that, but I would request our facilitators and experts who were there in the group uh, to play, please share their reflections and thoughts and the key points that were discussed. I would also encourage and request uh, if you would want to um, request someone from your group uh, to join in the discussion, please feel free to do so. Uh, let's go for